Today we have Mark Holzbeck on the podcast here on the episode two of the Spencer Covey Show. We are filming at Mark's home in Grand Rapids at above the clouds, and uh, where topics are wide ranging, including innovation and entrepreneurship, and uh, general uh, catching up. Um, Mark is a entrepreneur of great respect and regard, having done lots of uh, uh, experiments and developments in the hologram sphere. Yeah, that's right. And three di three dimensional display three -dimensional. technology and the MIT Media Lab and um, you were just talking about how you think innovation kind of has a um, script almost yeah in a way maybe you can expound on that well it's become mainstream mainstream yeah yeah so there's uh, you know chambers of commerce across the United States are funding innovation which usually means some kind of uh, program so uh, program and experts so people that are there are people nationally and internationally known as innovation experts and they are raking it in right now making a uh, good coin talking about whatever's uh, I'd say a lot of pretty standard ideas mm -hmm. but usually they're very uh, they do that with a lot of panache and, and personality and it makes it a lot of fun to listen to mm -hmm. and that's and that's what we're all in for we want whatever we do to be somewhat entertaining and memorable so if you can make your message entertaining and memorable you probably have a business What's the best, most entertaining message that you've heard? Uh, I liked the, uh, Daniel Pink's uh, second, uh, was it Second Brain or something? The, uh, the one where he said that uh, you can't outsource uh, empathy. Oh, <laughs> that's a great line. So he was talking about w where he might say overlooked um, uh, side of humanity is that we could probably automate and get AIs to do a lot of things that we do, but not that. And when we have caregivers, oh, now we're getting into. And do you do you was 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 his thought process that you just have to have the lived experience for the empathy to ar uh, be uh, arise? You know, I don't I know if that's really true because uh, we know that there are robots that mimic empathy and mimic nurturing, like. Uh, a robot that will hug you or hold you and people seem to be happy with those things yeah there's one guy that's I just saw a press release today trying to marry his robot that's not surprising <laughs> in fact he, he might be an attention seeker who just is doing it for that fair in yeah fact, we have artist friends who uh, intentionally made a big public release of um, marrying a tree oh and that was you know in order just to make fun of the panic that some people, the moral panic some people were having about you could marry anything now. Mm, to make a statement. Yes. Yeah. So with AI, I mean, not to, AI is innovation. How, what's your, what's your take on that? What are you seeing in the AI sphere? Is it, is it, do you find it to be exciting? Are you optimistic? Oh, I am. I love it. I just love automating repetitive tasks. Oh yeah. I guess I'm thinking of those, um, those robots that do backflips. Or like the General Dynamics, I think is the company, right? That has yeah, the, yeah. the the dog. Dogs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's pretty scary. <laughs> and <laughs> Hollywood is capitalizing <laughs> yeah. on that. Black Mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that episode. Yeah. The the and and now, uh, you know, there's all these drone displays, so almost like fireworks. You know, they're almost taking the place of fireworks, but the coordinated coordinated drones. Mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. To me, that's just. We're getting right there, dystopian. Those things could fly away with a baby any day now. You know, six of them or something. They go away with my baby. Yeah, but now it's gonna be a, a, a robot dingo. A, with my baby. Yeah, could you imagine <laughs> a, a, a dingo face mask on a drone, <laughs> with a sky hook? And it doesn't seem like there's too many limits either. I mean, I've seen some with like it seems like eight propellers flying people around. You know, I, I, and, and uh, Trevor Paul, he's the, I went to college with him at Grand Valley. He's the transportation liaison for the state of Michigan. 
and he did a post on LinkedIn, I think it was today or yesterday, about how Michigan and I hope I'm getting this right, the 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 facts the same, but I think it was Ontario are going to have out of out of sight um, air lanes for the drones to do transportation back and forth. What do you think about that? Sounds kind of like the um, FCC. Yeah. But it's the FAA. Yeah. <laughs> And the FCC, you know, allocates bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So there's limited resources that we all, they want us to have for the benefit of society. So so it sounds like that. It does sound like that. It's an interesting correlation. You're right. Uh, What do you, so going back to AI, Mm -hmm. and then we'll get back to innovation. uh, I'm so lucky that I actually knew uh, Marvin Minsky, who was a professor, one of the fathers of AI. Oh. And he was at MIT, and his office happened to be next to mine. No way. I don't know how that happened, but at the Media Lab. I think he had many offices, actually. Okay. He, probably, he was so important and so famous that he probably had many pied de offices. And, uh, and he was pretty um, comfortable just wandering around, and he wandered into my office one day and just stood behind me, and I was studying Japanese. Mm-hmm. And it'll, I'll never forget, He'll, he said, you can read that? And here's the father of AI mm-hmm. saying, complimenting me, I thought, you know, that's the way I read it. Mm-hmm. So I was, uh, and I couldn't, you know. I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't let him know that. I think I was pretty honest Were about you? it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we actually had somewhat of a friendship was because he liked people who were just, open and who does care. It? Yeah. yeah and that was uh, I feel like I'm that's me in some way what Being so we, gay is also like that too and you kind of have to especially at my age now <laughs> yeah uh, pioneer you just didn't have you kind of have to not care yeah uh, and I think I think innovation is like that too you, you can't just be riding some wave of popularity mm-hmm what do you think uh, the beginner's mind is it something that you can develop, or is it something that you just have, or is it... Hi, Dana saw it. My, my partner Dana just walked in. It's a good mic. They, come on and join us yeah. if you'd like. I can edit it, too. You know, it's not like it's... It's not live. It's just the voice. Yeah, and he yeah. can make you sound like Obama. <laughs> <laughs> We've got box wine. Yeah, I got the right wine here. Oh, okay. Well, why don't you have a, a bottle? Well, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, so look up Marvin Minsky because okay. he's um he's one of the the originators. Was was machine learning a factor in AI right from the beginning or is oh. that a new concept? No, it was um but computers at the time when he was studying when he started yeah, the field. Whole different. That was probably computers really weren't computers. Mm-hmm. I think it was the fancy late, calculators. I think it was when I was a baby that he <laughs> what? was that he started oh, really? writing about. Really, really? It. Yeah. Oh wow. Uh, did you ever get a chance to speak with him about what got him interested in, it in no. the first place? No, but um, I would go um, since we lived in Japan in the uh, '90s. He would often come to Japan, uh, being invited to give talks in different places. By you, no. or just in general? No. Okay. I was knowing him as family, um, friends with his some of his children also, and his wife, his widow. Um, I would get invited to things, mm-hmm. and so I would show up and hear his talks, and I would hear his talks m- many times. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like just, a comedian; he's got a bit. Just like uh, a lot of people at the media <laughs> lab, you know, and who are like the uh, the famous authors today that are on TED talks and mm-hmm. uh, podcasts. Mm-hmm. You know, you, after a while, you kind of know their message. Mm-hmm. And they give the same speech again and again and again yeah. to different audiences. But I would often be in that audience, so I would hear that same talk, which I think was good because I like reinforcement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it takes a while. To, it, you can only absorb so much in a sitting. Mm-hmm. So he was talking about he was talking about machine learning right from the beginning. No, what really impressed me about him was how much he liked being a, an iconoclast, mm. a figurehead. Is that no. what you mean by that? Okay. No. Okay. No. Maybe you can 
You, a figurehead might be an icon. Okay. Iconoclast is different. Though. Iconoclast is someone who tears down. Oh, okay. The, the icon or the figurehead. Okay. So he's the anti-hero. Yes. Okay. So he would be the uh, rebel. The rebel. Or the um, he okay. would say things that were controversial. Okay. And he reveled reveled in, in doing that. That's neat. It, it would. Do you think that he he would do that sometimes just for the reaction, just to be contrary, or do you think he, it was always from a genuine? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know internally what it was, but I enjoyed it. And I think that it's entertaining. Yeah. And I think it's your duty as a speaker to the public or to a group to be entertaining. Yeah. yeah. I agree. And there's so many professors at MIT that weren't. So he stood out that way. So, okay. So it's fair to say that you've, you've been immersed in... Um, aware of AI since basically the beginning or oh no no I was not aware at the beginning because I was just a baby oh that's right you but uh, okay no but I was uh, here um, but I was I became aware in the 80s so that was probably only 25 to 30 years after <laughs> it started yeah which you know it's, for many people it, it, yeah how has it evolved since you... Uh, oh, you know, this is not my field, by the way. I know it isn't. At all. I know it isn't. I, I, just, know, uh, I know, I know. But I slept in a Holiday Inn last night. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah, it, it's... Uh, well, we'll move on right after. It, it, has there been any specific things that you've seen as, you know, monumental changes since you've... Well, what I remember, uh, my friends who work in the field, who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back... I think back in the 80s, in the mid 80s or 90s, when uh, I was watching and paying more attention, I think that neural networking, I think was what they oh, yeah. it was just massive amounts of data that didn't involve a lot of programming because mm -hmm. you, know, you can't, so I think there were times when AI was trying to make up rules mm -hmm. and trying to program and uh, identify rules and make lots of rules for identifying intelligence mm -hmm. and having humans figure out what, it w what would be intelligent and programming. And then I think at a certain time there was a throwing up of the hands in which things are too complicated, we don't know how to specify this, but we'll just let um, a vast amount of data do our work for us and do it statistically. Hmm. You know, this, is ha this happens in, uh, in hard sciences like physics too, where you don't know what's causing something, but you just get a lot of data and you model it with statistics hmm. without knowing what the underlying structure is or the algorithm is, you just get you, you get a shape of what's going on with statistics, which we talked about earlier. Yeah, this Wolf Wolfram, go yes. or Elf Alpha Wolfram yeah. Alpha. Or you know, he's something. That Michael, our friend, mutual friend Michael Cohen, is a big fan. Oh well, anybody that's in the field would have to be. I'd imagine he's he's the man. Is he still? I believe so. I haven't so. heard anything about Wolfram Research for many years now. Uh, Lex, uh, uh, Lex Friedman just had him on the podcast. Oh, well, good. Yeah, on his podcast. Mm -hmm. Pretty well coded. Do you remember Kurzweil? Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. So when I yeah. was a, uh, I think I was a uh, high school student. Okay. Um, I had the idea that you could, that, and I had access to a PDP-11 computer. Oh, I've never heard of that. that so and you, we used... Uh, teletype and we used uh, punch tape to program it and I thought we could try to mix poems mm -hmm. out of, by looking at uh, existing word sequences and st statistically just trying to like what word would follow this word oh sure kind of yeah thing. and and so I made a program that did that and I don't think I was smart a super smart kid either uh, well, I don't think many people were also. No, I just said I was say. like I was a kind of a nerdy kid in the school, and not many people wanted to come in. Oh my God, my father dropped me off every morning early, like two hours before school started, because he was a doctor and he had to get to work. And so I was there on at school, and I had two hours worth of computer time with no one there. And so what do I do? And I tried to make a, a computer program that would analyze language and write poetry that was nonsensical. And it was, and, I, uh, and it was fun. That was a fun project, but that's what Kurzweil did. 
with he did something similar, and he did uh, I think with music generation, in which you analyze the patterns of music, and you would make a you could make a a program that would generate something in the style of Bach or Beethoven, hmm. just having statistically studied all of Bach or Beethoven, and he would do things like that. And I thought, wow, I have something in common with this great who made tons of money. Yeah, 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 and I, I think he still is. But I met him. <laughs> Okay. At a conference once, and I thought he was a total asshole. Oh, really? He's not very social, or he just he wasn't. No, he was, he was really very transactional, at least with me. Mm. It's unfortunate when you meet your your idols and they're well. He was famous. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, a military conference. Yeah. When you meet people that are well known, of course you're paying attention. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, he was kind of a just a switch person. You know, just oh. kind of turned off, and and. Actually, Steve Jobs did too that. I met Steve Jobs, and he came to the Media Lab, and he was really excited about holography. Oh, and, I bet. And very. And he wanted, and I somehow got a one-on-one. -on -one. He wanted to talk to me, and we sat down and talked about holography. What year is this? Probably 1988. Neat. 88 or 89. Yeah, those are good years. And he, uh, he switched off. He switched off because he asked me, "When will this become feasible technologically in the in the real world?" And I said, 20 years." <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was I, I, I was surprised at how quickly I saw the light go out of his eyes. Oh, uh, that's too bad. Yeah, but you know, it's, I have this it's great story. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you lived through it. <laughs> what was that? What? I mean, outside of the binary sense that I guess you're instilling or, or picture, I'm picturing, what was that interaction like? Was this, what else can you say about it? I mean, he's such an icon, you know. I thought he was, uh, you know what? In, con in, in similarity to Kurzweil, I thought they were both kind of transactional. Mm. At least I, I felt that from my perspective. It yeah. was pretty casual and pretty light yeah. in terms of getting to know them. Yeah. This one interaction. Right, of course. Yeah, what can you really say yeah. from however long? So going on about holography, you know, I'm, a, I'm obviously a layman. I have no idea. You know, I don't, I don't know what I don't know. Mm. What do you find to be the most um, applicable part of it, mm. you know, for a daily life? Well, you, you know, know, rather than talk about the technology, sure. which I've also found bores people. Sure, okay. Fair. I just remember last year we had this big event at the plant, which is this house that we own outside of Austin. Oh, we're going to have to talk about that. Well, I just want to say that the it, we had a, we got a big award, mm -hmm. and it was the what they call the 25-year award from the Texas Association of Architects, uh, Society of Architects, and it's the AIA branch of Texas, which is like seven or 8,000 people mm -hmm. that represent them, and they awarded us the uh, their big award, which is a legacy award for something that lasts and has retained true to itself. Oh. And has been maintained. You oh, know, that's fantastic. Uh, and, and, and keeps up with the original vision and has something that gives people inspiration and has influenced people over, mm -hmm. over that whole period. And I hope we'll continue to. So we own this house that was uh, made from pieces of an old cement plant and turned into a home for a couple in the Texas Hill Country, beautiful part of the Hill Country. Yeah. And I was shocked by how many shells there were in the just oh, the regular. Oh, yes, because that was underwater. That was in the ocean. Yeah. yeah. So you've been there, so you know. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, so you're you're one of the, the few people. 2019. Yeah, but I know, but in terms of the population, oh. you're one of the few people that have been there. Yeah, yeah. And so there are more people that know about it than have been there. Of course. In fact, we know people that are professors of architecture who when we bought the place and they know us and they they were surprised and they said I teach this house in our class Are you serious? <laughs> and I never quite knew where it was because it's a private it was a private oh a home it is a home yeah and we when we bought it we started a kind of new mission for the place which is to make it into a gathering place and yet we keep the location secret oh okay so we don't publish the address oh because we don't want people just driving by and looking at it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, 
Well, I won't either then. I'm not sure I even have it written down anymore, so I don't think I could. Yeah, but of course people have to know about it. Yeah. The people who come there for an event know about it. You know, we, we get the information out to the people who need it for that. But And we also give tours. Yeah. And if someone's an architect or interested in architecture and wants to have a tour of it, we're very, very welcome. So the, there's two primary oh, buildings. Well, can I just say that point? The, the point, the, where we got to this was that our uh, architect, the architect of this house, that is a friend of ours named Ted Plato, mm -hmm. lives in San Antonio. He, he, he gave a story about this house, which is never fall in love with a project. Oh, good. And that was one Maxim. of his, his uh, maxims to architects. Like, don't, don't fall in love with a project and just sacrifice yourself for it. But although this is this is a project he did, mm -hmm. and I think it's paid him off in dividends, but uh, I'd say the same thing is true with hol holographic imaging for me, oh. is I fell in love with the technology, and I th think that isn't really advisable, because you, especially when you start a company, and other people get involved, in it, especially funders, mm -hmm. and you're doing it for the love of the technology, but they are they want to see a return on investment. Oh. That you have a conflict, and there are, and that may not be pleasant at some point. Oh. And I think that's what Ted Plato was saying at the at the big award ceremony, uh, in which he was trying to give advice to young architects, like don't fall in love with your project, but yet. It's a conflicting advice because look at what he got. He got a really amazing project that is it defined his whole career. There are so many times where you have to hold that tension in your in the palm of your hand and look at it. You know, like how how do you not put yourself into a project like that? It, it's almost like it's almost like you have to have done that once or twice to to let to have to receive that advice. He must have felt some regret. Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't say that. Right. But yet, obviously, the result has been wonderful and, yeah. and very beneficial for his firm. Yeah. And and I, I wonder if the same is true for you. It's If you hadn't have fallen in love with the technology, would you be able to, in retrospect, say that you shouldn't? You know? Right. <laughs> is it? And, and isn't that conflict? Isn't, it's one of those <laughs> conflicting pieces of advice. Yeah. Because you often will hear people say, follow your bliss or yeah. follow your interest. Yeah. Don't care about anything else. Yeah. Follow so your heart. Follow your you, passion. And that seems a bit extreme, doesn't it? Can get that way. Yeah, it Is can. That, does that sound well advised to you? Yeah. And pragmatically, how do you, how do you translate that advice into reality? You know, is it... Is it that when you're working, it's it's that you take on the, the responsibilities and the roles that are handed before you and you do the work and you do it to the best of your ability, but you know that essentially it, your your project is going to be quote unquote adopted out to somebody else and so you can't fall in love with it kind of thing? Or is that is that the takeaway? I, I, I mean, think I... the world of work is fraught with problems like this and conflicts like this. Yeah, the duality. And so if you really care too much, uh, your employer might love you <laughs> because they see the energy you have and they feel like they're getting extremely good value out of you because you are working really hard because you love it so much. I, I've, I've fallen into that trap in the last, <clears throat> you know, five, 10 years. I was in a role that I absolutely loved that was not my destiny. You know, and it was it was difficult to, um, it was difficult to, uh, how do you say it? Um, the reality of the situation was very difficult for me, because of how much I loved the job. But it was a job, and it was a job. You know, you can't. <laughs> well, you, you know about our big great resignation. They say. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, which I think is a reckoning of people getting paid what they're worth. And people deciding what they're worth. Yeah. Oh, well said. So I think that's what's happening. It's really a shift in terms of people taking. It's they're not just going to be idle. They're they're going off to other jobs in which they're getting paid better and they're doing things. They've made a decision of what's best in their best interest. And that you can't blame people for doing that. And it's it's nice to see people making courageous decisions. Yeah, I think. 
You know, you only get one life. You yeah, only and get there's one probably go. more people uh, being entrepreneurs. I believe so. And they're probably listening to podcasts in which they talk about entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> and so what is, what is good advice? Yeah. What is good advice? And, and I don't think it's the conventional is conventional. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know it's cliche, but if you could turn back the clocks, what would you say to yourself, you know, as a young entrepreneur? There's no formula. There isn't. But there is a lot of benefit you can get from people with experience and know that, uh, and especially when it comes to don't do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whatever you do. So did you listen to all your mentors? Who would? Who would? Yeah. Right. Well, how, do you, how do you find the signal to noise ratio? How do you? It's probably emotional. It's probably just like, I like this person. I like what they're saying. It resonates with me. That's reality. Yeah. We, do, we make a lot of decisions based on our feelings. Yeah. Even if we don't admit it. Mm-hmm. Most well, that, people who think they're logical aren't really logical. And that Dunning-Kruger effect, you know. They, oh, Bill, that's another, that's another dimension <laughs> of incompetence. <laughs> Isn't it? Mm-hmm. Is, when, when I say that you can only take one step at a time, what does that mean to you? As far as entrepreneurship well, I, goes. I see it myself. I can't multitask. I can't either. I don't even try anymore. It's and, yet, and yet we have this uh, positive impression of people who seem to be able to do that and seem very efficient. Because what we want is, is optimizing our energy and our efficiency, uh, making ourselves efficient. Mm-hmm. And we want to do that as much as we can to our own, for our own goals. Mm-hmm. So go on. I mean, say, so when say you more feel, about I think that. we all have felt uh, that we've been multitasking efficiently. You you believe that humanity or society or just the ge- humans in general? I think or many people have. Many people, yeah. And they, they feel like, oh, I'm in the groove. Like, I'm picking up the phone, fielding this inquiry, this phone call, whatever it is, and then going back to work and then getting another phone call and switching and doing it and feeling an exhilaration that I'm, I'm doing it all. And they, they may be, maybe briefly, switching really well. But you know, we think that, uh, and this is kind of a tired cliche now, that the context switching is very inefficient. That's almost a cliche now. Yeah. So who knows what the truth is? What we believe today is probably not what we, we will believe tomorrow. I, I have always held the belief that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you, you can't have a job. You have to be all in on your startup. You, you, have to, you have to just do that one thing to the best of your ability until you can't anymore. And if you're not willing to do that, then, then you're not, you don't have it. You don't have the magic. Do you agree or disagree to some extent with well, that? Well, what I kind of agree with is that it's a social enterprise. Mm-hmm. That you have to sell it to someone else. You have to get it outside of yourself. And there are many people, and I know many of them, who feel that they have to hold it inside and par- out of mistrust. Mm-hmm. That if they breathe a word of their idea, that they'll lose control of it. And I doubt many of them have su- succeeded. I agree. I completely agree. The the side hustle though, the working at a job and and then doing your startup on the off hours. What's your take on that? There's a reality to needing to make a living at the moment. So so many things have happened that way, in mm-hmm. which someone had something else as their day job, and they did something else that turned into their day job mm-hmm. so you can't deny that people start somewhere they don't just quit and jump into their new endeavor without having some safety at all mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean people do it mm-hmm. and some 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 succeed but if you don't you have to have a backup plan yeah I I've always I've always jumped in with no backup plan. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't doesn't mean I'm right. Might well, mean I'm crazy, but 
I guess in a way. Yeah, that's true. You have some confidence in that you're going to be okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I don't... There's no... I, I have a huge safety net. I mean, that's... Yeah, I do. There's that. There's, there's, there is a confidence that I have. Yeah. And do you absolutely. feel like you... Uh, that you got to where you are out of lots of sacrifice and hard work? Or do you think you were lucky? I had that question posed to me earlier today. I have maybe a surprise answer, but it's a certain faith in the universe that it's conspiring for my advantage. And I think that uh, it's as goofy as it might sound that I have in my in my off and downtime, I've always focused on where I want to go. And then when I'm presented the opportunity to spout off about what it is that I've been researching, it's always been well received. And I have been extremely lucky to be able to talk to people that have received that passionate research report in a way that it's resulted in gigs. Um, so lucky, yeah. It sounds like the, uh, is it, I think it's the Louis Pasteur quote, which is Babel. Luck favoring the prepared. Yeah, it's certainly my uh, uh, my yeah I, yeah I follow that very intensely. I I was just talking about this yesterday. I have always very very consciously tried to be interesting by reading and researching and really diving into things that I found to be um, cutting edge and new and dynamic and. Was it for your own sake or for others' sake? It was very much for my own sake, but it was so all interesting to yourself. Interesting to myself, first of all. It ha it has to be a genuine interest that I'm that I'm passionate about for my own reasoning. But but then I find that it often translates to others. And so it, it at first it was just, you know well, here's Dana sitting in the room. You wanna sit cool next shirt. to me? I like this. <laughs> Didn't want to interrupt. It's a great shirt. Well, you, Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's all edible. Yep. Dana's wearing a shirt that is oh. made out of uh, a brocade from Bhutan. Oh. It's very shiny and, and looks very uh, elegant. It doesn't surprise me at all. This is, this is a great shirt. It's part of making the world smaller. Welcome, Dana. Thank to, you. To episode two of the Spencer Covey Show. Yeah. <laughs> Who can help us to make the world smaller? Because that's our mission statement. That is a beautiful mission statement, as a matter of fact. What does, uh, when you unpack that, where, what's the, how do you, how do you, how do you measure that? I think it's uh, feeling connected to people in very, even if they're in very distant locations. How's that? How's that? Uh, is that phone calls? Is it letters? Is it visits? It's, it's kind it's of a, an emotional connect feeling, like knowing them first. Sure, yeah. Having you having met them. Yeah. I say that's generally physical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which well, is very privileged, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it is nowadays. Yeah. So, yeah, especially when you're talking about a place like Bataan. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Yeah. And for those that don't know, Bataan is, is somewhat famous for measuring happiness, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, although if you also look at who is, uh, oh, he according, to, do nice according to authoritative sources, who is the happiest country uh, on earth? It's not Bhutan. Who? So, like the uh, you, you, United Nesco? Nations. Yeah. Who but, do they claim is? I think they use, there's a lot of, there's more, multiple organizations trying to measure happiness really? across, the, across the globe. And I would say that Bhutan is actively interested in trying to become the happiest country. Oh, see, okay, well, if they're actively focusing on it. And on a national basis, it's a monarchy, and they have a, a king mm -hmm. who has, in the 70s, said that this is their goal. That's a beautiful goal. Yeah, and he's and he's no longer the king. He's his son is the king, but he they they continue that goal, and you, they have offices, governmental offices, in, that are focused on trying to make the whole country happy. Is there a time in your life that you can, or a moment, or a or an experience that you can easily look back on and say that you were, on, extremely happy, like like more than usual? Right now. <laughs> is that right? Oh man, why? Well, I guess as you get older, you kind of don't care so much, Fair. and and you you really just trying to live your trying to 
do the things you want to do before you die. Mm. And if mm. you feel like there's you can, some reality for you, if you feel like you can do it, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty happy. Mm. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. I feel like I have it's within my grasp. So that's probably unusual for people to have that within their grasp. I, I think that Dana, would you like to add to that? Okay, fair enough. I'll I'll add. My to mouth it. is full. I'll add to it. Yeah. I I think that I'm happiest when I am working to my greatest ability, when I'm expending the most amount of effort I can possibly expend into something that I feel like is feeding my soul in a way. Okay. That So can you give me a little like a chopping wood? Oh, wow. Stacking wood. I not I would not have Image that unless you had said it. Well, it's just a, it, it's it's uh, it's one of those time based things. I was just thinking about it yesterday. Um, driving Satis- long distances. Sat- satisfaction. Yeah, it's it's satisfying. It's it's using it's using what I've got. That's when I'm happiest. When I'm when I'm actively using what I have. Okay. What about right now? Right now, I'm using what I've got, and I am very happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you the happiest you've ever been? I, yeah, yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> absolutely, without a doubt, without question, I absolutely am. I think I am too. Yeah. Without any reservation whatsoever, 100% the happiest I've ever been. Absolutely. I guess there's a word, uh, phrase, self-actualized. Mm. Uh, I think I can't pronounce because I'm drinking wine. Oh, well, that's fine. What, what's that? How do you define that? With self-actualized, what's that? That you feel you have agency. Oh, yeah. In mm. other words, efficacy. And a freedom. belief in, the, in, in yourself that you can do something that you've set your mind to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, That's part of happiness. It's got to be. You know, and I, and I think if I'm not mistaken, Bhutan's kind of like a manual labor type place. If it's, uh, if I believe. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah, I'd say it's very philosophical. Oh, go on. What do you mean? This the national religion, mm-hmm. Buddhism. Yeah, is a. Some people don't call it a religion. It's uh, I, right. It's more of a mindset, isn't mm-hmm. it? And philosophy. Yeah, and it's it's accepting hard truths and uh, and trying to banish illusions. Mm. Let's say you. Let's Ooh. say your main goal is to banish illusions. Oh. Okay. It, that's a good mindset to have. How does... Illusions can be so uh, um, fun, though. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so if you actively banish them, I could see that. Because you, you never want to lie to yourself or others, you know, especially yourself. Yes. And or, or especially lie to yourself. Yeah, because a lot <laughs> no, of people... No, no, especially if you want to lie. Here. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's, so it's very conflicted. You could say yes and no. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword. Banishing illusions. And what was the other part? You Being just happy? Said, no, you said um, focusing on one thing and... Holding two comp contradictory ideas yeah oh, that's what in your F. head Scott Fitzgerald said that's he he was def, his definition of intelligence was the ability to hold contradictory fact contradictory ideas in your head at the same time is that intelligence or wisdom I don't know yeah I mean it's just some it's but something it's, he yeah. said that people quote a lot yeah it, it, it certainly is true whatever the you know semantics of it are we should get your AI to <laughs> Or AI should know. We'll, we'll get we'll get the reference. Do you do you do you remember the best line of the poem that it came up with? Do you, do you have any? It wasn't like, a poem. Well, I mean, but the nonsenseness of it. Do you do, was there a line that you still recall? Oh, I from, think it was more like witty repartee while drinking wine or or, or, or a martini. So I think it's uh, somebody recorded something he said. Oh yeah. In okay. Interview. Yeah. He was asking about your computer project in high school. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. My God, we're back to that. Well, I'm just looping back to it. I'm wondering mm. if it had, if there was a specific line that you remembered that it came up with, because because oh. I was just you know. Oh, the... you know, I wonder if I have any uh, any of those poems. You're talking about the poems. Yeah, the yeah, nonsense yeah, poems. yeah, 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 yeah. Nonsense um, poems. Is yeah, it? You, you know, said it though. The witty repartee when drinking wine or martini. I mean, that mm-hmm. was good. I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> no, it's just things like uh, you know nonsense, like using making a, a sentence that 
grammatically made sense. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But didn't make any sense like the purple rose yeah. turned, played horrible music. With a cello on its arm. But you're kind of going with the music, mm -hmm. you know, it, it had so much nonsense that it wouldn't, it wouldn't hold together as a, as a concept. It would just, it would make grammatical sense, but it, it wouldn't make any uh, other sense, even metaphorically. But, but you could, of course, it would challenge you to challenge your brain because your brain is kind of an association machine. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, words that don't go together or f concepts that don't go together, you, it would keep you kind of busy. Your mind would be busy. What's, what, is your, what is the last time that you can really remember having something that you were researching or looking into or what have you really click? Like, a lot of people call it an aha moment. Oh, yeah. When's, when's the last time? Can you recall clearly? I usually, usually was in con uh, collaboration with someone. So I liked oh, uh, thinking neat. together. Oh, that's really and I think I'm more of a verbal person. External processing? I don't know. I think it's just verbal. So speaking. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I like to think aloud. So neat. Say, what if, you know, rather than just ruminate in my own mind, mm -hmm. I like to talk to someone and kind of go somewhere as too. a journey, kind of a verbal journey, mm -hmm. and, um, and talk about ideas. And to me, they are externalized while mm. I'm speaking. It's almost like someone writing on a blackboard or something. Mm -hmm. So I, I, they stick in my mind as I'm speaking them. They're not just gone. Mm -hmm. They're there, they're kind of out there, and they're kind of hanging there. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about something and my, my processing will externalize it, and then they might weave in some other things, and then together they'll, they'll Commingle and make something that wouldn't have existed if we hadn't uh, collaborated. Do you have a research project that you're working on right now? Is it what are you looking? What are you interested in these well, days? Well, my research partner is Dana, who's here, <laughs> and we talk pretty frequently about all sorts of things. And uh, although I don't think he shares the same, uh, let's say, love of externalizing ideas verbally that I have. Well, that might be even better though, because then you can be a single sounding board almost. You're not competing mm -hmm. for, or. <clears throat> yeah, I also um, w externalize my ideas in writing. Oh, journaling? Yep, journaling and um, mind, mind my notes. maps. Yeah. I love um, my maps. And that is interesting because uh, what's great is I, I'm also, how should I say? Um, in my work, I do a lot of looking and, and reading and editing other things to get something f further along to a more focused point. And so Mark can be talking and kind of riffing, and I usually keep my mouth shut and <laughs> listen. listen. Sometimes he's, I open my mouth and he says, will you let me finish? Which is, <laughs> I do. But, but, yeah. but, but he's in the flow. So one of the things that, we, that you were, both were talking about is what is happiness. And you mentioned chopping wood. There's a wonderful book that's called Flow, which is which um, is uh, explores the way that when one gets in, I mean, we could say in the groove, um, or in a in a gets in a hyper um, aligned state in within yourself with what you're doing, and and so that is. Um, is certainly a desired destination to be able to, and we, one can train oneself. It's or there's this idea of focus, hyper focus. Mm -hmm. um, I've got and it. so ADD. That, is, I think it should be yeah. reclassified as hyper focus disorder. Yeah, yeah. Which, if I mean, Which if sounds you, like a good thing. yeah, I do. If, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Much better. It's yeah. I, mean, I don't mean to interrupt. Like no Please deficit. Continue. Well, no, no, like, absolutely. You know, excessive. Yeah. Ex Attention excess well, it's, disorder. It's it's from the perspective of the teacher. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you, the teacher is saying that mm -hmm. the student has attention deficit when in fact they're just not interested in the thing that they're talking about. They're very. I, I'm mm -hmm. speaking from experience. I am very interested yep. in one thing at a time, and it's probably not going to be biology or history. Sorry, they're very interesting mm -hmm. subjects all on their own, but 
I'm completely absorbed by the thing. In high school, it was all video oh. games. Mm -hmm. I was, it was puzzle video games, yeah. not action shooters. It was always puzzles, like Final Fantasy mm -hmm. and stuff. Well, no, no. So what this what this makes me, what a good conversation does is is spins you out into different areas <laughs> yeah, right. and different yeah. directions. So one of the things, one of the people in Grand Rapids who have been in, um, thoughtfully inspiring to me is um, this uh, nonprofit organization called Disart, um, oh, yeah. which was co-founded by Chris Smith and Jill Vin. And they've come to, to the Grand Rapids Art Museum um, to talk about um, uh, sort of a disability awareness and what they do and also this the, the idea of disability culture and how the constructs uh, have been developed in our culture. Um, one of the ones which is, which is especially troubling is a medical def deficiency definition. It's like uh, from the medical community says you are um, unable to do certain things, so therefore it's a negative thing. Whereas what they've been talking about, is, especially as cultural workers and um, aligning with artists and those people expressing themselves, is to see it as a positive is how is my experience different from yours and how is that an asset rather than a, a problem? I think it's they still they, have abilities, plenty right, of them. Yeah, yeah. And I think this falls and, back into our conversation about um, empathy and that you can't outsource empathy. Ooh. So what yeah, makes us yeah. superhuman is, is our ability to empathize and when it comes to disability, and disability culture, it's that ability to empathize and, and also I, and identify. They right? say uh, th that there's different things within the culture that are expected which shouldn't necessarily be expected, like to be able to climb stairs. I mean, so for it's example, for people that can without help, well, <laughs> shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mean, no, but but the world remember. the world is created in a particular way. Stairs. Oh, and w there's no reason why we can't change the way we design the physical environment, that's one thing. 100%. Well, it's, it's, um, or, it's also our realization that we are all temporarily able. Well, mm. Yeah, or that... So that we're all going to be there. Right. I mean, so, for example, there's a lot of people who, until they have a skiing accident, don't realize how hard it is to walk on crutches or that a ramp, or if they're in a wheelchair, the uh, ramps are necessary and that they don't notice them until there's a change in their um, capacities. Yeah. And well, as we grow are, older yeah. um, or, or have different, have accidents, that changes our capacity. So what we, so this is the movement of a um, uni so-called universal design is addressing and helpful of that because it was kind of Previously, the control of the majority or the the, um, the common denominator of what people could do, and it's like the the world would be a better place if we expand our capacity of understanding empathy and designing for a much broader range of experiences. Yeah, I think, and I think there's an economic component because it costs something. Mm -hmm. People don't. So I think there's been a historical hesitancy to pay for it, and partly it's because they don't identify with the disability. And I think once people dis identify with the disability, mm -hmm. they're more willing to pay for it. Well, there's also an economics right. of upfront investment, and then there's the economics of loss. Mm -hmm. Christopher, so, have you heard of Christopher Alexander, the mm. the architect? <clears throat> He's his the book the big book he wrote that very huge book. four four volumes but uh, he's written design what is it called design um there's synthesis Wait. of form there is the adapt um there was like a thesaurus living it's called it. it was like oh I know what you're talking about chapters on yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on design for architecture yeah yeah I've got a lot of his I've got the majority of his books mm -hmm. his um his process is adaptive adaptive design. So, for instance, you might have a set of steps. If he was to design them, you might have a set of steps that could also be turned into a ramp with mm -hmm. a lever. Mm -hmm. 
you know, kind oh, of that's thing. That's cool. But he, he, I remember reading his book, one of his books, and he said Oregon experiment, Oregon experiment with not that one, but one of his books said living structures. You should never live uh, more Third. than three or four stories yeah. above the ground. Yeah. And here we are, um, 30, 33 30 stri- stories, ten times more than he said. <laughs> yeah. And I think he, the the reason he gave was. If you're a child and you're looking down and you want to see, see other children playing, you want to go and join them. And you want to be able to envision yourself being able to. And he's uh, right. I mean, that was a, a kind of a little picture. And you, and you can't you identify with the people that are down 33 stories below you. But you can get a very nice view of the landscape. Uh, here we are. <laughs> I mean, you know. Like... We, made, we made our decision. <laughs> yeah. We're here. Yeah, yeah. And so that's like a conflict in my mind. Over what he said. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's also, you know, saying that in the realm of young children, too. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's... How can you argue? Right? Yeah, he's, he's probably right. You know, And there aren't many children who live, live in this village. <laughs> Not many, I don't mm-hmm. suppose. Mm-hmm. Probably some, but they're on the third floor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, I'll have to take a picture, too, and kind of put it on the B-roll or something like that. So getting back to empathy, um, or even, or even getting back to aha moments. You know, you had said that a lot of times that you you found them by essentially externally processing with others. Me, you, yeah. And Dana, you're more of a mind mapper, journaler. Can you remember the last time you had a a a, a specific you know, kind of like aha breakthrough type moment, and was it? I guess it's. Uh, I responded to something you said sure. earlier that I overheard sure. while I was chopping tomatoes, <laughs> not chopping wood, but um, is tomatoes that need chopping too? They do. To have to always be exposing yourself to new ideas Mm -hmm. and that um, there was a museum director uh, Richard Gashalik who once was talking about how you could be better um, a more well-rounded museum director he said once a month buy a magazine in a um, if you're passing through the airport about a subject you know nothing about it could be canoeing it could be um, dentistry it could be whatever but he said the benefit of pushing your discovery level in different areas will help you understand and reframe what you do on your day to day basis and um, and so that's a sort of uh, my aha moment is to discover like um, new areas that people are people are working in or interested in um, that I had never thought about as a as even a category. So, like for example, one of the things um, that I've come to enjoy through travel and through um, and and exper- personal experience is cooking and oh. and world cuisine. And then the there's. We should probably mention the clinging is cooking. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, but every so I'm I am my background is I studied art history, and I then got a job in museum and have sort of worked my way up and organized exhibitions. Sort of is humble. Yeah, but <laughs> if I what I realized so about twenty years ago, someone told me that there was this field called food history. Oh. And in and that. There are mostly coming from anthropology, but now it's more and more documented. And if you if you look at all the cookbooks that are now being published in different um, international cuisines and different subjects, there is uh, there's a whole research area about who, how we eat, what we eat, and so it's like I, my aha moment was, damn, if I had known. That I could, oh. <laughs> instead of being an art historian, I could be a food historian. Then um, that would be just fascinating. And so I sort of have developed and continued my as an amateur food and 
learning about the food and the roots and the um, the aspects of it. I'm gonna go get my. Oh, it's done. It's it's all done. You can okay. come back. What a great. I would have never in a million years imagined that there was such a thing as food history. Well, yeah, so. I, it's just. It, that's what, that's. I, I love think we're it. talking about convention because um, what do we know and uh, what seems surprising and new to us. And he's talking about a moment in which he realized there was something surprising and new. That is a wonderful, that's a per. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. Please what, continue. A door's open to, as a perspective to think that we're eating cheese and salami, and there are people who have spent their lives um, studying the different types of salami. There are people who make the salami um, there and cheese. So one of the things that, that was fun a year ago during the pandemic was the Grand Rapids Art Museum collaborated with the um, this company Art of the Table. Oh yeah, to, to create, wealthy, right? Yeah, yeah, and um, an aperitivo, and we had a three session uh, live experience. event that was called Art, Wine, and Food, Neat. and we had three themes, um, three weeks, three different. Each week had a different theme. Um, the first one was Sparkle, and <laughs> so it was based on the idea of New Year's and champagne, and so. I talked about art that's in the museum on view it was a, on view at the museum that had a sense of sparkle and the art history of those works and the specific aspects and could show images because we were it was a live zoom call um, the next one was with the theme of red and I talked about artworks that are red um, I the Grand Rapids are um, city Owns a and you Calder were, you bike were one speaker, sculpture. Huh? Several. Yeah, right. Well, so I. This Calder's is what I did. Rare. I did the art. Yep. So Calder red, and then the final one was white. We were joined by a wine ex wine expert, Amy Ruiz, talked about wine and. Sommelier, um, I'm sure she'd call herself. Yes. Probably right. Yep. Yeah. And um, Talon. Evan. Evan Talon who is a cheese expert, the cheesemonger. Cheesemonger. Yeah. What a great name, right? And so <laughs> he talked about we're, cheese we're, we're through, with these yeah. with these um with these themes. And what was wonderful was the cross-pollination and it was like, "Well, I didn't know that." And he said, "Well, that and I we would sort of do a quick little preview of what we were talking about and then there was this cross-pollination of um of how the flavoring <laughs> or the particular aspects of the wine or a cheese experience related to the visual experience and vice versa. Do, do you know what that makes me think of? And is, is, wouldn't it be nice to be able to have these kind of multifaceted type of experiences be, <laughs> be, be, be more common than less common? You know, the overlap, the Venn diagrams of things. Yep. I think that, I think that there's, I, I love this. I've, I've been hearing it on Instagram, you know, the um, uh, jack of all trades, master of none, but still better than a master of one. Oh, that's good. Hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's I, so many people that want to specialize, which mm -hmm. is to be admired, you know, and we were just talking about hyper focus. So I guess this is also going back to the holding the the two different things at, at once, you know, but it's so much fun to explore. What is a subject? Right. Good point. What is focus on one thing? Well, just taking cheese and wine, you know, there's, there's sommeliers and then there's cheesemongers, you know, and, and I'm sure that there's sommeliers that, both, that know yeah. just as much so, about so, cheese. Um, you know, I can tell you from experience that if you go to a cocktail party and you tell someone you're, in, you're interested in physics, they think that's really specific. Go on. <laughs> I'm sure they do. And they think, and not, and not interesting. Well, well then they're not initiated. <laughs> I don't know. I, I give it. I give them that. I think yeah. I empathize enough I to mean, understand what those people might so be thinking. So, you're, you have a degree in physics. Yes. Tell us more. 
oh, I, I not only do I did I get a degree from a liberal arts institution in physics from Middlebury College in Vermont, but then I went to MIT and to Harvard and studied astrophysics, and then taught junior level physics classes at MIT in all the kind of uh, seminal experiments that happened in physics up until the, until then. Classical. Experiments. Um, yeah, I classical. I don't know because uh, you know they went into uh, into the modern day into okay. things like nuclear magnetic resonance. Mm -hmm. yeah. We would exp we would re replicate experiments, cl uh, famous experiments in physics, and we would replicate them in the laboratory for the students and give them their uh, firsthand experience, so that they would actually recreate in a way the original experience of having discovered something. So, oh, see, that's just beautiful. Oh, giving so, them the firewall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can imagine all the uh, overlay of pressure. Yeah. Of being an MIT student. Oh yeah. In your junior year, um, and so, but I was there and kind of facilitating. You might say facilitating. Sure. Uh, and and it was great for me because I would uh, I would sample a variety of experiences in physics in physics experimentation. And then I also knew a lot of physical uh, physics theorists who were there at MIT, and they all liked me. I was kind of a <laughs> likable person. My life better. They want to help me, so they were. Uh, I realized the social aspect of um, just be, being a, a nice person and uh, sociable, and uh, talking to people, and uh, and how that could advance you mm -hmm. in life. Yeah. So, you know, the, so relative, I'd say when I talk to people that are entrepreneurs, and maybe this podcast is going to go out to people that are entrepreneurs. Let's hope so. You know, that, that I think one of my pe main pieces of advice is to be sociable and to uh, listen and to try to interact in a meaningful way uh, and not just try to sell something. Well, and so Amen. building on that. It's connecting to something that Mark said earlier, I would say the word curiosity is a, is essential to be an entrepreneur and also to be outwardly focused or externally focused rather than internally. And maybe that's where it connects to this idea of holding two um, divergent concepts Computing. that you need to be focused like a laser on your entrepreneurial idea and to understand it and to be in the moment uh, as and un and thoroughly committed and yet at the same time you need to be uh, aware of your surroundings or have really wide peripheral vision hearing and so to understand the context of where you are and so there's a lot of um, discussion in terms of mindfulness of being understanding a flow of consciousness that is outside of you um, and being, and I would also say there's empathy, there's also humility, and maybe there's, there, there's a humility deficit. One, one thing okay. that I want to well, sneak in here before we finish up is that you gave me an exceptional piece of advice that I don't even know that you know that you gave me. We were, we were meeting one time for coffee and I was talking to you about how I had this idea and I was, and I was meeting with a bunch of people and this and that and the other thing and he said well meetings are easy I stopped setting meetings the next day I and me, I I had this in my mind that the meetings and the talking and the in the the connecting and the and the networking was the most important part of the project and and you had you had said well the meetings are the easy part then I stopped I stopped immediately the I, next day. I don't know the context. It, we, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to throw I wasn't that out there. I wasn't there, but I should say, if what popped into my head is if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, did it make a sound? So if no one, if you have made a brilliant business plan, however, it doesn't reach the right yeah. ears, yeah. then it is. It doesn't make a sound. It does not have an impact. I mean, and so and that's where... we were where, talking about that, about people's fear to share their ideas. Yeah. Well, and there, that's partly because of uh, capitalism and the, the first to market and, I mean, the, the, the 
um, idea of um, scarcity. scarcity mentality and losing, also yeah. we were much more sensitive yeah. to losing and we competition and get rich quick or get rich um, I mean there's this, this it's we are <laughs> talking about consciousness yeah we are we are, are in America in our society right now we are immersed in a capitalist society that we were raised in and that most of what we read and see on television and what and what our schools teach us is that value is is based on financial power security etc and so um no wonder what <laughs> well but because that but that's different from we were talking about bhutan which was immersed in a buddhist philosophy and have has different values and so um, one of yet, the yet, yet very savvy economically being um, yeah. focusing on high dollar tourism instead well, of that's a, mass tourism yes but primarily the average Bhutanese is not no. benefiting from or thinking about that and, and do you think they are benefiting? I think they're benefiting maybe they're benefiting I'm sure the infrastructure is Benefiting yeah. by by extent. Uh, Go on. What were what yes. Were Sorry, well, you. so in a conversation about about equity and um, so and um, racism and um, accessibility that I had with um, a friend of mine, she pointed out that it's like if it's it's like the fish that's swimming in water is like doesn't isn't aware that they're of water, the existence of water, because that's all they've known. And like we've been raised in a capitalist society that values um, the power of money, and there's a higher implicit, well, there is a inherited hierarchy of um, rich versus poor, um, buying power, having certain types of sneakers or, or eating particular, I mean, we talked about wine, cheese, and food, it's like that's not a that's from sustenance, and it has a power in the same way with with racism and sexism is that there's certain assumptions that have been in, well that ingrained. have been taught to us ingrained in the it's in the air I mean and so the the there's a wonderful book called How to Be an Anti Racist that talks about how you need to be need to retune your awareness to all the signals in this country and actively and actively work, uh, um, work against it yeah and call it out and it's I mean it's a it's yes, a work. journey and it's a struggle and it's a responsibility and it if you and you and there's another book that I found interesting is white fragility oh yeah. Yeah. And um, so that the idea, the thesis of that book is I got that, called out for that before. Yeah. I had no yeah. idea what it was, and then right. I think I got, got called out for it. And I was like, "Oh shit!" And then I knew. Well, and right. I needed to be called out for yeah. it to know that it was a yeah. But it's partly because of the you're you've been raised in a particular uh, frame of reference. Yeah. And that's where the shifting of there's many different frames of reference, and that's where my quick passing comment about consciousness is there were many different ways of being conscious and and so much to be conscious about and so maybe the aha moment oh, is, see, this is another, that yeah. when something that you that like um you say a childhood rhyme or you know about the book that um is i mean one of my first jobs at a was this chain of restaurants which is now called Denny's, which was called Sambo's. Oh, neat. And it's not neat if you know this, the book that's called Little Black Sambo, oh, which is a racist school. story, which actually is featured of, of Indian people, yeah. but it is, but it was... It's a culture of confusion. Yes. Mm. And, and so it relates to um, the imagery of racism and against black people and colonialism. And so, in fact, this is a good time to put a, to to do a plug for the um, Sambos. 
No, no, <laughs> no Sambo's. And not Denny's. No. <laughs> yeah. The racial, the awakening and awareness of the Jim Crow Museum that's at Ferris State University. Oh, super um, cool. Which is, is planning an expansion. But their, their founder, um, David, Dr. David Pilgrim, be, is an anthropologist and began collecting these objects of, uh, of hate, of representations of racism. Racism. And um, it expands, and so it. Like, what do you do with what do you, artifacts of racism, of hate, and what he's what his philosophy and the, and it's embraced by the university is if we do and, and and sort of connected to the idea of those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. Is I was that, going to say as long as you know the contrast. Well, right, and as the long context. As you're contrasting it and not going in there as some super racist, like ah, super cool. You got to go in there with right. the mind of like not cool. Well, but they're yeah, exactly. I but would if say more interesting, sure. Like I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and yeah. I mean, and lots of people walk there and go, "Oh, my grandmother had that," or yeah. I didn't know that I had eating no idea that the lan- the lantern. The oh, yeah. lantern person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure oh, people jockey, have seen yeah. it. I, jockey. I didn't. I had. Yeah. I had no clue. Or even Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben. That's arguable, but most people are in consensus that it is racist. Mm-hmm. But many people grew up with it. Yeah, they grew up with it. You're immersed in it from the beginning. So and it's, it's it's not. So it was considered normal. Cream, you need the contrast. Yeah. yeah, but do you think that there's a product named after the black astronauts and inventors and etc. I mean, that's where. That's the visibility and issue of, well, no one... Are there any final... We're going to figure it all out. Yeah, we're going to figure it all out. You know, and I think that that's the whole point here. That that you can't figure it all out, but you can figure it all out one step at a time. Oh, good. Okay. Phew. Yes, and I would say, because I'm the kind of person who sits down and writes things out, is to do... I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I like I'm a convert to um, the ideas of get what's called getting things done, and I listen to podcast um, called Asian Productivity, and um, so no, it's by Asian people who are <laughs> very productive, <laughs> um, and I'll send this to you before I post it. That's yes, we have. I, yeah, I oh, forgot see, about the. Posted. I didn't sign any. Um, <laughs> what What do you call it? Permission rights. Um, That's not your voice. That's an AI. It's an AI that you invented uh, twenty years ago. That was Obama speaking those words. I know. Isn't that amazing? Um, <laughs> get yourself together. Um, Also, so another thing that's important is the joy of life and laughing and that and play. And so here in Grand Rapids, we have advocates for laughing as with Laugh Fest and of play with the Children's Museum. And they take this seriously. And it really, it's important (laughs) is to think about joy and to, to find your fun. Yeah. And especially in the times of the roller coaster of the COVID epidemics, oh. um, we just have to understand that we give each other grace, but also to, I mean, I mean it's a cliche, but find, find some bliss. Amen. And find some peace in each day and grounding. And that's... That's something that in Western culture we're not trained, especially in America. It's compete, get the edge on um, the other person, is and use your elbows, um, and that is has hurt us a lot. This whole term that it's just business. Yeah. I was I was talking to a guy that's real high up in IBM years ago. He's like, well, we're just here to maximize shareholder value, mm-hmm. and I and I. Oh, yeah. I almost that's walked I'm away. I'm just like... It, but that's the culture that's, in which... It's not enough. Well, but other people say, well, okay. Milton Friedman. Uh, and it's a... Absolutely. But that's a... 
that is a perspective and it's also a separation between work and life yeah and and that's and that's the other thing that might not be that great well that's it's right. necessary in a lot of cases is, but bring yeah. your whole self to right. what you're doing i was going to say yeah the whole self is something you're a whole racist so if you are i mean so people <laughs> well, know it but also you your know? vulnerabilities i mean there are people who i believe that people don't have a capacity to understand racism until it's until they can see a, 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 the world from a different point of view and it's that idea that you're swimming in water um if you're a fish, you don't know that there's a, other worlds out there. there. There's air. I mean, it's like... But there was a time before racism. A, a long time ago, but it was... it was a, And it's a fascinating story. Yeah, learn about that. Yeah, I would give a plug to this co- podcast called Seen on Radio, which talks about whiteness and the concept of whiteness. Um, and also about... Um, male and female differences and so there's a series of discussions and dialogues that are really brilliant and wonderful and I learned so much and so during the early part of the epidemic I would the my workout would be climbing the stairs in the in a um, high-rise condo and I would listen to podcasts and climb up and down and listen it was a amazing (laughs) kind of (laughs) quiet it was a quiet space to understand and learn um, the racial reckoning and other reckonings that need to take place. And it's a partly is, again, connecting back to this idea of those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And also, it also helps you, if you don't know history and you don't have a perspective from other points of view, y- you are living in a... Um, a narrow reality of your own self-centered interest. Isn't that the truth? And it's and it's harder to get out of that. Maybe and, an understandable reality of your own self-centered interest. Well, it is, and it's also comforting. It's like, well, self-reinforcing. Like, this is, yeah, yeah, this is the way that it's always meant yeah, to be. Yeah, we could have more. Or, well, if we could, we could all, I think it's about abundance. Like if you think about it, it's sharing. We could, we yeah. could yeah, we could benefit like that stone soup children's story mm-hmm. we could all be yep. better off mm-hmm. together yeah well let's end this on some like um personal personal type plugs we've got tiny world tours yeah uh is it tinyworldtours.com if i'm not mistaken isn't it yeah, it is and, and the planetkyle.com and the planetkyle.com k-y-l-e k-y isn't it? L-E, yes. <laughs> L-E. <laughs> dot org. <laughs> I'm going to have to re-record. Well, you're, you're Can you record that? <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I was, I was typing in Best Buy, and I, I mistyped it, and I typed in Best Butt, and it, it still got me there. Mm-hmm. Wow. One T. Mm-hmm. One T. And then, I, and then I got interested in it, mm-hmm. and so I typed in who is dot com you know yeah. best butt yeah. dot com yeah. it's the same one i yeah. think that best buy owns best butt dot com mm-hmm. um almost 100 mm-hmm. percent. they 100 percent own with one t mm-hmm. but i think they own with two as well mm-hmm. maybe more maybe three so we've got we've who got three butts oh uh okay. kardashian for sure <laughs> hey, did you ever see that that movie um with arnold schwarzenegger the one with the girl with the three boobs i think the kardashians oh, yeah. are gonna oh, yeah i think the it was it was famous for i i think total the, recall total recall thank you um see i have to i have total recall. <laughs> as a matter of fact you proved it um okay so yeah i think that's that's a good that's a good way to wrap this well, up. Dana, any, you, any parting comments? I, I want to show you my third boob. I'll, look, Mark. I'll, oh, look. I'll here, twist here it. it I'll twist Oh, yeah. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. Dana, any, any parting? And my third butt cheek. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I think that people are going to take these BBLs best to the next I have level. The best butt. And they're going to have like two and then one above it. You know, they're going to have the third. Do you. Yeah. yeah. 
It's gonna have to get cyborgy here after a while, you know. There's only so much you can do with the human body. It's innovation. Yeah. Yeah. In entrepreneurship. <laughs> it's in the in the most real form there is. Any parting words, Dana? Would you like to say something? You have to recall it's a very small yeah, audience, so you know. Yeah, I know. Um, you have to totally recall. I think. Therefore, I am. Yeah, no, that's been said before. Um, we need to be more reflective. We need to be more aware, um, and under and and the uh, enjoy the pleasures of stretching oneself, mm. crossing over and interconnecting boundaries. So. Earlier, Mark mentioned going to Middlebury College, which is a liberal arts college. I went to Carleton College in Minnesota, which also is a um, part of white privilege, and I was privileged to go there. The emphasis is on interdisciplinary learning, and that's something which I've carried forward in my interests in art and culture. And so that is my closing comment focuses on understanding different frames of reference as well as the many areas of inquiry to make the world more interesting but also a better place amen so in, we in, 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 and it really and, comes down to inquiry it seems yeah you know ask questions i think that that's i think that's the issue is ask questions mm -hmm. well, I like you know don't be afraid of, um, to ask questions making the world more interesting make the world more interesting is, ask questions well that is kind of from your don't own perspective don't be scared is a what per from your own perspective don't, yeah don't well, be scared it's a, right. bit, it's a bit selfish which is i think okay yeah. so i think we all make selfish decisions we make decisions about what do we i i but it's getting out of your realm to to meet different people i mean it that's is. where it's like we have we, more to gain. we've lived here so for 10 fun. years and one of the things that has been a priority is to try to be a community connector pull the ball forward how does it make the world a better place for everyone and what's what it, it one of the things that always makes me happy is when people say when you introduce me to x person I learned so much, I did this, I was empowered to move into this area, or um, it's just great to know and that this is happening. People say, you probably don't realize. That's <laughs> how so you know it's gonna be. <laughs> I, I said that. Yes. Sure. I said that. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, but it doesn't, It's that's not why we do it, or, uh, or because it's really gratifying just to, to how should I put, say, connect some dots and step away. Yeah, yeah. And let and yeah. when it comes back, it's like being at a nice at a good cocktail party. You'd say, "Oh, do you do you two know each other here?" Of course. And then you, you know say, each other. "I've got to go stir the rice," and then you they you actually have to do, which I do. Okay. All right. Well, here's thanks, to dinner. Thanks, everybody. That's it.